Well, Shabbat Shalom and welcome everyone, both in the room and online watching the, the video. I'm Ralph Matazelski of Derek HaMashiach. Uh, we are Beit Midrash, um, a house of Messianic learning, and currently we are studying the Book of Acts through the framework of Judaism. This week uh, we're on study 12 and we're focusing on the prayers that were mentioned in Acts chapter 2 verse 42. So we looked at that last week, the four devotions. This week we will focus on the devotion of prayer. But before we start the study, let's actually pray ourselves. So as we start to look at these prayers in a bit more detail, we'll actually start to um, study some of the things that we're praying before and afterwards so that we get a better understanding of why we pray them and what they actually mean to us as Messianic believers. Uh, I think it's important that we know what we're, what we're actually praying rather than just doing it, you know, monkey see, monkey do sometimes. <clears throat> so last week's study we finished with a quick introduction of the two main prayers of Judaism uh, that would have been recited uh, around Yeshua's time in the temple sacrifices. Uh, you see them there, the two prayers are the um, Shema, which means here, and the Amidah, which means standing. And they're prayed at several times throughout the day. We finished with uh, what is considered to be the greatest prayer in Judaism, the Shema, is to hear. So um, it's actually almost word for word from Deuteronomy chapter 6, verses 4 to 9. And through this prayer, uh, the reason why it's considered to be probably the greatest prayer in Judaism is because through this prayer, God is defined by the person praying as an absolute unity. It says, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. Um, in fact, this prayer is actually more a blessing than a prayer as we understand. But could I have a volunteer please to read? Mark chapter 12, verse 28 to 34. <laughs> One of the Torah teachers came up and heard them engaged in this discussion. Seeing that Yeshua answered them well, he asked him, which is the most important mitzvah of them all? Yeshua answered, the most important is Shema Israel, Adonai Lenehu, Ad Adonai Echad. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. And you are to love Adonai, your God, with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your understanding, and with all your strength. The second is this, you are to love your neighbor as yourself. There is no other mitzvah greater than these. The Torah teacher said to him, Well said, Rabbi, you speak the truth when you say that he is one, and that there is no other besides him. And that loving him with all your heart, understanding, and strength and loving one's neighbor as yourself mean more than all the burnt offerings and sacrifices. Then Yeshua saw that he responded sensibly and said to him, you are not far from the kingdom or far off from the kingdom of God. Um, keep going. No, that's good. Thanks. Mm. So we can see that when Yeshua was asked what is the greatest commandment or the first or the head, um, depends on what um, translation you look at pardon me he said the greatest commandment is what Shema Israel. Shema Israel so it's more than just a prayer it's more than a blessing it's actually a commandment uh, to keep that at the forefront of our minds and our hearts so for me is the question is if if um, Christendom uh, says that Yeshua did away with everything and only, we only do what Yeshua tells us to do, then this probably should be heard from every church on a Sunday morning because, now seriously, he said this is the greatest commandment. Yeah. We should at least be doing this if he did away with everything else. Yeah. But the challenge here is for me, more so as Messianic believers, uh, because we align with what he's teaching. We also align with his background of what he's teaching. So we really should be... Um, praying this ourselves, um, if not once a day, as he commanded, or as the, in fact, Deuteronomy commands. Uh, when we get up, when we lie down, when we sit in the house, um, when we're on the road, basically all the time, we should be having this at the forefront of our, of our hearts and our minds. 
and we should be teaching these to our children. Uh, that's you know part of that commandment. Teach the prayer more than just the prayer, but the prayer is the start. You know, it's it's everything else stems around that. God is one, and then everything else. Once you start getting that foundation wrong, then everything else falls apart. Um, So this part won't be in your slides because it, I only came across it yesterday and I'd already printed everything out. It'll be on the slide here. But uh, the thing hit me about the Nicene Creed, um, which is an interesting one. It says, I believe in God, in one God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth and all things visible and invisible, and in one Lord Jesus Christ, the only begotten Son of God, begotten of the Father and so on, um, who for us men and for our salvation came down from heaven. So there's nothing wrong with this prayer or with this creed as such. Um, and then it talks about, I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord, the giver of life, who proceeded from the Father and the Son, with uh, who with the Father and the Son together is worshipped and glorified, who spoke by the prophets. There's probably one line I have a little bit of problem with this creed and the thing of worshipping and glorifying the Holy Spirit. I don't see that anywhere in the apostolic writings that the Holy Spirit is to be worshipped or glorified. In fact, uh, the Holy Spirit is the one that always points to Yeshua, who points to the Father in terms of our worship and our adoration. Um, and, and this is probably, well, it's interesting. The, this was um, adopted by the Council of Nicaea in AD uh, 325. Sorry, I've got AD in there. It should have actually been CE, Common Era. Um, but I, I'll probably include this because that's, that's the replacement theology point of view here that they're putting forward. Um, it was meant to be against the heresy of, the, of Arianism, which is uh, they wanted to teach that Jesus is like God um, and that he is, sorry, that, yeah, that he is like God, that he is a God-like being, but he's not true and eternal God. Um, it was revised by the Council of Constantinople, Constantinople, I should say, in 381 AD, uh, which enlarged it to include the concern about the Holy Spirit. So the, the uh, Ruach HaKodesh was included in there uh, a little bit later on. The doctrine of the Trinity features quite heavily in this creed, even though it's not actually mentioned in there. Uh, it, it, this creed was all about the doctrine of the Trinity. It was set forth by um, the father Athenaeus, uh, who was the leading theologian of the church uh, in that era and on the council. The Christian doctrine of the Trinity is basically holds that God is three co-substantial persons or hypostases the father the son and the holy spirit as one god in three divine persons the three persons are distinct yet are one substance essence or nature so i don't want to deal with the, with the topic of trinity today because that really is almost two studies worth, I can tell you. It, there, there are, there's arguments and understandings to both sides and trying to understand really what the Trinity or how God can be one and three manifestations. It, it takes quite a bit of delving into uh, the scriptures and even uh, Rabbi Shapira goes into some Kabbalah understanding of this some, in order to bring clarity of how Yeshua and the Holy Spirit and God the Father are really one, but there are three manifestations. It, it's, it's not as easy as just, you know, we can't just say, oh, this is, this is the truth. But, um, but having said that, yes. we will actually dedicate a study to that. We will. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. and unpack that using Rabbi's um, yeah. footnotes. Footnotes, or probably main teaching, and we'll add some footnotes to his teaching. <laughs> <laughs> So it was actually um, uh, written particularly, they say, it was written particularly against the teaching of Jehovah Witnesses. 
uh, and I'd heard this before many times, uh, many years ago as well. Uh, and yet others ascertain that it was written to um, counteract Judaism because Judaism openly had the decree of God is one and they were against Yeshua even being the divine son or divinity or any form like that. So uh, it's interesting that it happened, that it was, I suppose, uh, formulated around about uh, 325 because that's, that's around... Um, Constantine's time, that's around the time when Christianity f was formally made a, a official religion of the Roman state, when Saturday worship was officially changed to Sunday worship. Um, it's all around that same time. So it may not be directly involved or, or written for that cause, but I think it certainly added towards the, the final split between uh, Christians and, their, and, the, and the roots of their faith. You know, that sort of sealed the the thing where all of this swung across and now you don't even say the the one that god anymore in the shema you now try and turn it into one god and three and then you know that whole doctrine of trinity so it it brought it not brought it i think it cemented the division it was like the the final hammer that pushed the wedge in and split the uh, there's lots of other things and we'll actually cover those as we as we go through the the studies so back to the shema the Shema can be said uh, corporately or individually. It, there's no rule around when or how to say it. However, as corporately, it has a lot more um, uh, significance uh, because you're actually declaring as a unity, you're declaring, declaring God as one, as a unity as well. So there, there's power in that. Um, you know, we say when there's a group of believers together and they're praying together, there's, there's power in those prayers. It's, not more, it's more powerful than one person praying. It's the same concept here. Um, the essence of the Shema uh, for the person saying the, this prayer or, or um, blessing or uh, commandment even is that that person is taking upon themselves the kingdom of God. In other words, the sages teach that one who says the Shema takes upon himself the yoke of the kingdom. They, in essence, become kingdom builders. And Rabbi Shapira says, as Messianic believers, um, that's our responsibility as well. We are kingdom builders. We're about building God's kingdom here on earth. And so uh, the Shema for us should mean something important as well to become kingdom builders. So although this prayer is officially only said two times um, a day, so it's said uh, before the Amidah in the morning and before uh, the Amidah after sunset at night and one time just before going to bed so it's the last thing you say before you go to bed to sleep um, it's um, it's actually something that should be on our on our lips in our hearts the whole time uh, it talks about writing the word in our hearts and the way that we do that is by focusing on them and repeating them and, you know, turning them into actions. And um, so part of the repeating of the Shema is actually um, writing them on our hearts. You know, that's the, the two go hand in hand. If you're not saying it, if you're not focusing on it, you're not putting it into your heart. So it's a, it's a two way street there. We are to speak the word continually so that we can write it on our hearts and become kingdom builders in every circumstance and aspect of our lives, not just on a Shabbat, but every day of our life we need to be kingdom builders. So when you're praying this prayer, if you're wearing a prayer shawl, so I'm, ga I'm, gonna, I'm throwing in some uh, logistical things as well as some you know, meaning type of things um, for this. So when you're when you're wearing a prayer shawl um, during this prayer, it's customary to grab your zitzits in your left hand and place them on your heart. Um, the zitzits uh, represent the 613 commandments, so you're placing the commandments on your heart when you say this prayer. Um, and there's a third section in the, um, the, the Shema prayer that we'll look at in a minute, it's, it's, it's actually in your notes, um, where it talks about the significance of the, the zitzits, why, why we have the zitzits. So uh, the, the prayer 
covers everything. The other two sections uh, are in your handout. So um, this is from last week. Uh, so if you didn't bring your handouts from last week, I'm sorry about that. Or I think we had a couple of spare copies if you haven't got one. So page two, three and four is the Shema. So page two is the first part of the Shema, the Deuteronomy uh, 6, 4 to 9. And then the second part is Deuteronomy 11, 13 to 21, which is um, both sections are said by everybody. And then the third section, which comes from Numbers 15, 37 to 41, which is on the back page, that's typically only said by people wearing zitzits. And so you actually grab, change the position of zitzit from the left hand to the right hand. And then every time you mention the word zitzit or fringes, you actually kiss the zitzits, the fringe. So I've got uh, a star next to the word zitzit uh, on, the, on the last page so that you know that that's the point where to, to kiss the, the fringes. That's in, if you um, want to do the Shema with a prayer shawl on <laughs> and you're wearing zitzits. Again, the, the second part of the prayer um, encourages us is about uh, the tefillin that we looked at last week, the, um, uh, the one on the hand, or actually the Jewish places to put it there. So when you're praying, it actually goes close to your heart and the one between your eyes or on your head. And also talks about the mezuzah again. So twice in this prayer, we're encouraged to um, put the word of God on our, on our hand, on our arm, on our forehead, and on the doors and gates of our house. And the reason for this is so that the word becomes prominent in our lives, you know, so that wherever we turn, whatever we do, uh, the word of God is there encouraging us. So, a question for the group. One question. Um, I think there's something missing in the Shema. Have a look at, if you've got your handouts, have a look at um, the second page, Deuteronomy 6, 4 to 9. Uh, have, a, have a quick read of it. See what's missing for us as Messianic believers. Correct. Well done, Kim. <laughs> What did Yeshua say in Mark 12:31? He said, again, Kim? And your neighbor as yourself. Yeah, love your neighbor as yourself. Uh, yes. So while the um, scribe that came to Yeshua asked him that, he, he included that in his well said, um, good uh, rabbi, you know, you've, you've understood it well. And he said, you know, love God and love your neighbor. It's not a standard part of the Shema. I think as Messianic believers, because Yeshua's focus was all about relationship with one another and relationship with God. Uh, he, he didn't come to teach halakha because that was being taught by the Pharisees. He said, you know, the Pharisees teach, do what they teach you, don't do what they do because their attitudes and their hearts were wrong. Some, not all of them, but some. Uh, he said, but do what they teach you. I have actually come to teach you the um, ethics, the morals of you know, the, the whole relationship thing. How do we deal with one another? And so that was Yeshua's emphasis that supported this prayer. And so for us as Messianic believers, I think that we should add that in uh, when we pray the, the Shema. The Baku, which means blessed. In a corporate setting, uh, when there is a, a minion present in a Jewish um, synagogue, or even in a Jewish meeting, um, and a minion is uh, 10 Jewish men or more, then the Baku, the blessed, blessed is recited before the Shema. So the order of prayers is the, the Baku, blessed, the Shema, and then the Amidah. So I've sort of started in the middle, I'm going forward, then we'll look at the Amidah in a minute. It is the uh, official opening of a prayer service in a synagogue. Uh, what, if you're really strong Orthodox, if you don't have your 10 um, Jewish men there, you actually can't have a full, proper official service because you can't do the, shem uh, the, um, uh, the Baku, the blessing, and so you can't officially open the, the service. It, you can still have your service, but it's not um, as powerful as it would be with the 10 Jewish men. 
For this prayer, the men are to raise their voice or blow a shofar in order to bless the Lord. So, unfortunately, I've been to too many messianic and other circles where you just blow the shofar for whatever reason to call people in from morning tea. Um, I personally have a bit of a problem with that because the shofar is meant to be for specific times, you know, warning against uh, war, calling people together for a certain reason. In this case, it's for blessing God. So I, I think the Messianic community has gone a little bit loose with the, with the shofar blowing. You know, we just do it for whenever reason we want and it's got specific purposes that's mine that's my thought you can probably disagree with that I'm, I'm okay with that that's where I come from um, so this prayer was introduced by Akiva uh, he was a second century um, uh, rabbi or sage who had a lot of input into the Mishnah um, at the time in fact his student was No, he actually, he supported Bar Kokhba. He thought Bar Kokhba was the Messiah. And then when Bar Kokhba rebellion failed, and then he turned his back on them. But the guy that um, was, it's about Lag Baoma, um, the one that went into Shmu, what, um can't remember his name now. Rashbi. Uh, Rashbi, yeah, yeah. So um, he, he, was, he was the rabbi that, that taught these guys. And uh, so 200,000 um um, sages basically were killed through the plague and through other things at the time. So that's that, you know, I'm just painting some context. This is where uh, Akiva fits in. Uh, he, he was the one that introduced um, the Shema um, or, or formulated that, that Shema prayer. So it's not quite as old as, uh, not the Shema, sorry, the, the Baku, right? Uh, so it's not as old as the Shema or the Amidah. The Shema and the Amidah go back to the men of the Great Assembly. But what we have in our prayer set is, is a compilation of, of prayers that go back to the first um, destruction of the First Temple era, right up to um, the 1200s, uh, where um, um, the Adan Alam, which is... Um, written by, I should know this, uh, hopefully Rabbi Shapiro is not watching this because <laughs> this is part of the test that I'm going to have soon. <laughs> so, um, but, but it was written in, in the 1200s. Uh, so, the, you know, the prayers range quite a bit in, in terms of age. Um, in fact, uh, as we've learned that um, Shimon Kifar probably wrote the Nishmat prayer, which is also in here. So that would have been around the same time, maybe a little bit earlier than, than Akiva's. Uh, prayer. So another question. Can anyone tell me what the word blessed means? struck me. It means um, it means to be grafted in. Mm. It means to be grafted in. Mm. Mm. Correct. The that face value, the word um, baku means to kneel, right? To, it means knee. And so it means to kneel, and, and that is or to, to bow in submission. So that is why in this prayer, whenever we say blessed, and let me see, I've got it here on the front page. You'll see little um, orange arrows if you've got a colored handout. If it's a black and white, it'll just be a, a gray arrow. Um, when you say Baku, you actually bend. And when you say Adonai, you come back up. Uh, so the Baku means to bend your knee in, in worship, in reverence. And that's done a few times through the prayer, as you can see in the, in the orange arrows there. So we, we bow at blessed and stand up straight at Lord. But as Marie's already said, um, the... Um, the word Baku comes from the root word uh, to be engrafted. So in essence, what this, Lord is, what this um, prayer is saying is that we are petitioning uh, God that we be engrafted into the house of Israel. Um, so in essence, when we say the Baku, uh, we are petitioning our desire to be grafted into Israel. So but this is the prayer that the Jews do, 
right? Interesting. It's not just the Jews that need to be, uh, sorry, it's not just the Gentiles that need to be grafted into Israel. The Jews also need to be grafted into Israel. They know that. Um, we'll, we'll cover that a little bit more in detail when we start to look at Abraham, that, that whole concept. Uh, but yeah, every, every Jew also needs to be grafted in just as much as we do. You know, Paul says not every Jew is a Jew. Not every one from Israel is, an, is from Israel. Um, they need to be grafted in. We need to be grafted in. So just a quick note about the prayers. Um, the way I've set it out is I've got, in most of these, I've got the Hebrew first. Uh, then I've got the transliteration underneath. And for, just to make it a bit confusing, for the Baku, I've actually put the transliteration re read in the same direction as Hebrew. So Hebrew goes from right to left. So you can see Baku, Adonai, et um, Ham, Vor, Orach. Okay, so you, you're reading the words backwards. Unfortunately, I didn't get enough time to do that for the Shema prayer. So in the Shema, you have to read it in the English version. But there you've got the Hebrew, the, Eng the transliteration, and the English underneath. For the Baku, you've got the English in a separate section down the bottom. And when we do the Amidah uh, later on, the Avot prayer, I've got the same again. I've got the transliteration from right to left. So w when I was preparing for my uh, studies for the prayers, I, I copied and pasted it so that you can actually learn to read in the same direction. You know, otherwise, you've got the Hebrew going that way and the, and the transliteration going that way. I wanted to just line the words up so that I could at least you know, know what each word said in the transliteration. So it's part of my study aid, but I think it also helps um, others who want to learn that way. <clears throat> so now we'll have a look at the Amidah. The Amidah is said straight after the Shema, morning and night. The Amidah is actually said three times in the middle of the day as well, but the uh, Shema is not said in the middle of the day. going to ask what um, what do those three words mean there, shaharit, mincha and ma'ariv. Morning, midday and afternoon. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> three times a day. <laughs> that's, that's the official name for those prayer times. It's also said on Shabbat, uh, but it's said in a different uh, format on Shabbat and we'll have a look at that in a minute. I don't want to go into too much details. I don't want to be get too le legalistic or legitimate, but um, just, to, just to give you an idea of what the prayer is about and the context. The prayers are always said facing Jerusalem. So could someone please read Daniel 6.11 for me? Okay. Someone with a Tanakh. Daniel 6.11. 6.11. Mm -hmm. Don't forget to turn your microphone up too. <laughs> when Daniel learned that it had been put in writing, he went to his house, in whose upper chamber he had windows made facing Jerusalem. And three times a day he knelt down, prayed, and made confession to his God, as he had always done. That's it. Thanks. So, do you want to know why we face Jerusalem? Because Daniel did it. <laughs> They've always done it. So, I don't need to explain any more about that, do I? I <laughs> could. In the handout today with the prayers, I think... Uh, there's also the, I've included a little section, a little discussion about how do we find where Jerusalem is, uh, where are we are in the world, how, you know, because that's always a bit of a confusing. Um, 
There is an app, yes. There's a couple of apps that actually uh, point towards Jerusalem, but you can't have a metallic um, or magnetic uh, base to your phone because that actually sets, changes the <laughs> setting on it. So if you want to find exactly where Jerusalem is, take it off and then it, it'll um, point you there. Now, if, if you've actually got an ark in your synagogue, then you don't have to face Jerusalem. You can face uh, the ark. The ark being the, ca the, the cabinet where the Torah scroll is in, uh, because that's sort of representative of Jerusalem. Um. So after the second temple's destruction in 70 CE, the Council of Jamnia determined that the Amidah would, would substitute for the sacrifices directly applying Hosea's dictate in Hosea 14.3, which says, so we will render for bullocks the offering of our lips. And so that's the scriptural background to why, why the um, sacrifices can be replaced with prayers, because Hosea actually prophesied it. He said we could. Um, some of those prayers, as, as I mentioned before, actually already went along with the sacrifices. So they were being done as part of the sacrifice. Uh, but when the temple were destroyed the first time round, the men of the Great Assembly got together and said, well, how do we continue to practice Judaism without a temple? Because Judaism focused all about the temple. Once the temple was gone, Judaism could have been totally wiped out. But they said, well, um, we, we'll do as much as we can without the temple. So they continued the prayers without the sacrifices. So that is in place of the, the sacrifice, because we can't do the sacrifice, but we can still do the prayers. So before we start the uh, Amidah prayer itself, um, we first pray Psalm 51, which says, Open my lips that I may declare your praise, uh, as, as King David said. And then what do we do? Then we pray the prayer silently. <laughs> Bit of a contradiction there, isn't it? So we ask God to open our lips and then we pray it silently. Why? It's called the silent prayer, actually. Well, in our small study group later on, we're going to break into small groups after the coffee time, and we will actually have a look at the background to that. So something you can uncover yourselves rather than me standing here uh, telling you everything I know, which I don't really know because I got it from somebody else anyway. In the morning and the afternoon, uh, but not at night, um, the, if there is a quorum present, uh, of 10 male adults, then the, the reader, the Hazan, chants the Amidara a second time and the people then, the congregation responds with, blessed is he and blessed be his name each time God's name is mentioned and amen after each blessing. So in that circumstance, it's actually said openly as well, aloud. So it's, it's like a double thing. Uh, I remember it was quite confusing not knowing this background when we went to um, Hudson, um, the Bethel, Beth Emanuel assembly there, and we joined in with their prayer time and knowing when to be quiet, when to, sp <laughs> and it was all in Hebrew. Even though there was some English happening in the background, they were doing it all in Hebrew. And it, if you don't know any of this and you walk straight into it like we did, it, it's, it really is very daunting. It was, it, was a, it was great to experience. There was just something about it that was really, tangible and uh, but it was confusing at the same time because we didn't know what to pray and where to pray and <laughs> which page <laughs> so in a synagogue service prior to the Amidah it being said the entire congregation rises and takes three steps forward <clears throat> at the conclusion of the prayer uh, they step each person step takes three steps back so the stepping forward is symbolic of entering into God's presence um, you know, it's like entering into his chamber. And it, uh, if you can truly encounter God if you are open to, you know, it, it's, it's the whole thing of um, putting actions out there and, and then expecting um, an experience to come with that action, you know. So stepping into God's presence, if you open yourself up to God's presence, then he will be there, you know, you can experience that. And so that's what the, the stepping forward um, represents. Why three steps? Well, 
they're, a, they're a mimic of or a, um, a representative of the three steps that Moshe took when he entered into prayer. Uh, according to the sages, Moshe traveled past the three partitions, the darkness, uh, the first cloud and the second cloud before he entered into the divine presence to spend with God. <coughs> Sorry. Um, oh, I think I'm fine, thanks. So we stand with our feet close together, facing Jerusalem, and every person concentrates on his or her own prayer. And probably that's another good reason to have it silently or, or speaking it just at a level that you can hear yourself. You, you're actually focusing all your attention on this prayer, um, all your attention on your communion with God at that time. Uh, some people sway. Um, some people look at the prayer sitter and look up and down. Uh, it's all part of trying to keep the concentration on that prayer, to stop your mind wandering elsewhere. When, remember the, the Shema, we talked about uh, closing our eyes and putting our hands in front of our eyes. Uh, that's all about focusing concentration on that so you don't get distracted with anything else. The same with this prayer, the, the stepping forward, the coming into God's presence, the saying it quietly, uh, the, the swaying or the, the going side to side. Um, some people call it demonic that don't understand what this is about but it's really all about focusing your whole energy, your whole physical uh, being on spending time uh, in prayer with God Just quickly on that the yeah. Hasidic Jews liken it to uh, Shabbat candle or the menorah the flame that oh, right, back yeah. and forth mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah. So the Amidah is a yep on the right page sorry the Amidah is a sacrificial prayer. Uh, again, there's bowing in the prayer at the beginning and at the end of the prayer. After we say Psalm 51, um, and before we actually start the Amidah, uh, we take just a moment to say in our hearts, in our, in our internality, in our kavanah, it's called in, in Hebrew, we say, I am willing to give my life for the sanctification of his name. That's, that's what... Um, uh, Judaism does you know it's it's more they don't say it but that that's like an internalization and w when I read that I now, now I understand why rabbis such as uh, Shapira and Italki and Bernstein are so passionate about the pronunciation of the, the sacred name they you know they want to guard and protect that that whole thing and that's um, you know that's they give their life to to do that and we've seen videos where all three of them passionately uh, defend the thing of not saying the sacred name. Um, and I can understand, you know, the, the oath that they've taken within themselves to, to not um, to do that. The Amidah is broken up into three main sections. Um, and within those three main sections, there's a total of 19 benedictions. Originally there was only 18 and a 19th was added after the time of Yeshua and uh, many believe that it was actually formulated as a curse against um, believers in Yeshua that were participating in the prayers. <laughs> well, we'll get to that. <laughs> um, yeah. So, I mean, we've, we've already established the fact that um, at least early in the, in the Messianic uh, Jewish movement or in the Believers movement, they continued to pray in the temple, they continued to pray with the normal Jewish prayer service and um, this was getting on the nose of some of the, um, uh, the leaders of Orthodox Judaism. Uh, but we'll, we'll go back to that in a minute. Um, the three main sections uh, are broken down uh, three main sections which are done on weekdays only. On Shabbat this is slightly different. They're broken down into uh, the Shavach, which is praise, and it serves to inspire the worshipper and invoke God's mercy. Uh, the middle 13, so the first uh, section is three, three benedictions. The middle section is 13 benedictions uh, called the Bakasha. Uh, which is requests, so that's when the requests are made. Uh, there's six personal requests, six communal requests, and finally a request that God will accept our prayers. 
And then the final three blessings are known as the Hoda, which is gratitude, and it's basically thanking God for the opportunity to serve Him, uh, which is very similar to what we've always come across in Christianity in terms of prayer life. You know, you know, you come in, you give thanks to God, you petition, then you finish off with giving thanks. So that pattern is is common through Judaism and Christianity. So the first two sections of the Shiva and uh, Hoda'a, um, they are standard in every prayer time of the Amidah. Um, on Shabbat, though, the middle one is changed slightly. So instead of, instead of having 13 benedictions in, on the Shabbat, uh, there's only one benediction, sorry. Um, yeah, there's one benediction known as the Kedushat HaYom, in other words, sanctity of the day, and oh, sorry, that consists of seven benedictions. So it's it's thirteen compiled into seven uh, into that section. The nineteen blessings of the normal weekday can be found in your handout. Um, here we go. So it's on the on, on the back of the avot prayer. I'm not going to go into each one of these in detail because if we did, we could spend weeks on, on this subject. But I'll just go through, through the 19, just the, the headings. So the first one is the Avot, the Ancestors. And we, we'll focus on that one a little bit more because that's pretty relevant to us. Uh, the second one is the uh, Gavarot, Powers. And you will actually do some work in your small group study time on that particular um, prayer or, or benediction. The third one is the Kedushat Hashem, which is the sanctification of his name. Then the fourth is Bina, understanding uh, Selicha, which is asking for forgiveness from sin. Geula, redemption. Uh, Rafua, healing. Berkat Hashanayim, which is blessing for the years. Galuat for the dysphoria. Burkat Hadin, which is justice. Burkat Haminim, which is uh, another, this is the second one we'll focus on, the one that was added, the prayer against sectarianism or heretics, uh, the Sadikim, the righteous, the Bonne uh, Yerushalayim, builder of Jerusalem, the Burkat David, the blessing of David. The tefillah, prayer, avodah, service. That's a good one to study as well, uh, but we won't go into that one. Um, Hadoah, thanksgiving, and then the final one, which is uh, sin, shalom, grant peace. A lot of these benedictions come uh, either straight from scripture, uh, as we saw with the Shema, or they're derived from scripture. So they're either scripture or derived from scripture. Uh, some of them manipulate it to make it into a prayer rather than, than straight scripture. And as I said, we could study those and spend uh, a lot of time looking at that, but it's, it's probably something we can do, or you can do in your own time, when, when you start to do the prayers and you want to know more about each particular uh, individual benediction. So as I said, we want to look at the 12th benediction, which um, is the um, prayer against heretics. So as we know, early Messianic believers continued to worship in the temple um, as well as the synagogues alongside the Jews who practiced Orthodox Judaism. So there wasn't too much difference there at the time except you know, one believed in the Messiah had come and the others uh, didn't. That happened, that sort of lasted until about 95 Common Era or maybe as late as 135 Common Era. Um, by that time, the early assembly was made up of both uh, Jews and Gentiles who believed in Yeshua as the promised Messiah and Saviour of Israel, in fact, the whole world. That's why the Gentiles came in as well. Unbelieving Jews, uh, mainly the leadership, were obviously not too happy with this. And so around 95 CE, uh, Ramban Gamliel managed to get a 19th blessing introduced into the Jewish uh, Amidah prayer. Well, Ryan 
has maybe a little bit different opinion on this. Um, a lot of commentators say that this was put in as a curse uh, against those that believed in Yeshua as Messiah. Uh, there, there are actually Rabbi Shapira doesn't have a too much of a problem with this either, and and we'll see why in a minute. Um, but let me just give you the background to it, and then we can discuss. <laughs> um, Rabban Gamliel, and remember the name Gamliel? He was one of the um, sages, and um, I think this might have been a, a third one down the line. Though. It wasn't the one that um, Shaul was uh, a disciple of. It was one of his children. Uh, but he was in the same, same lineage. He commissioned Shamuel, Shamuel, sorry, Shmuel Hakatan to write this prayer because it was considered that Shmuel uh, deeply loved his fellow human being and could be entrusted to construct a prayer such as this because as the uh, Avot 4.24 tells us, do not rejoice in your enemy's downfall. And this was something that uh, Shmuel um, could be entrusted with because he was very compassionate to his fellow man, whether they be a Jew or a Gentile. So they thought someone who's compassionate towards everybody is probably the best person to write a curse about them. <laughs> a blessing, I should say. Or a, <laughs> a blessing in disguise. <laughs> so they said uh, because um, he had his life... Because of his love for his fellow man, he could be entrusted to write a prayer which was free from animosity and schadenfreude. Uh, schadenfreude is a German or Yiddish word, probably, uh, which means joy of somebody else's sorrow. So it's, uh, <laughs> it's a great word, isn't it? Schadenfreude. schadenfreude. <laughs> the idea was to include a benediction that would cause so-called apostate Jews. Okay, so it's probably a little bit wider spreading than just Messianic believers at the time, but apostate Jews from no longer being able to join in the prayer service, or at least the Amidah. Among apostate Jews were what Pharisees considered to be the Sadducees and a number of the other sects. So it wasn't, again, like the, um, the Nicene Creed that was written, and it looked like it could be written for a certain thing, this benediction in the Amidah might have been written for a certain thing, but could be covered for more. So, you know, it's, you can look at it from two angles. But it's an interesting, um, the footnote in the Koran prayer setter that, that I have here, uh, which was um, edited by Jonathan Sachs, who's the chief rabbi of London. A uh, very uh, wise person, very di uh, diplomatic person, but he's not a believer in Yeshua. Uh, so, you know, he's got his bias in this. Um, this is what it says in the footnote there. He says, its origin, uh, its original object was the sectarianism that split the Jews, the Jews world um, during the second late temple period. Late second temple period. I've got dyslexia. There were Jewish, uh, there were Jews in the Hellenistic age who turned against their own people. Faith in Judaism involves the idea of loyalty to a people and to its heritage. This prayer is a protest against disloyalty. Okay, that's a very diplomatic way of putting things because which one of the sectarian sects of Judaism had actually the, such a movement that could have split the Jewish world? The Essenes? Probably not. Um, some, the Sadducees? Yeah, but they weren't that different. The only ones that were was really strong enough to split the Jewish world was Messianic Judaism. So, you know, reading between the lines, I really believe this prayer was originally focused towards them. If we read it from its original wording, which... I've included in your notes, um, I think it's the bottom of the, the prayer section. I won't read all of it, but I'll just read the part that is of interest. It says, let the notzerim and the minim be destroyed in a moment. The word for notzerim is Nazarenes, which is what the early Christians were called. So it's specifically targeted towards them, but it's targeted against anybody who is 
um, an apostate Jew, basically, against unity of Judaism. In today's prayer setter, they say it like this. May all your people's en enemies swiftly be cut down. So it's been reworded, and consequently, I'm reasonably happy to say that prayer because I don't consider Messianic believers to be the enemies of Judaism. Uh, I don't consider us or myself to be an enemy of Judaism. So I personally am quite happy to pray this, pray this version of the prayer because I, I say the same. You know, the enemies of Judaism want to kill all Israel. And we, I'm not going to say who they are because we all know who they are, right? Um, there's, there's a couple of strong religious sects out there. And unfortunately, at the time this prayer was written, Christianity had, was, was becoming stronger in the Roman world. And there was a very strong persecution from Christianity towards the Jews. So I can understand that this was targeted towards Christianity as well, but maybe not Messianic believers. So, you know, the, the split's starting to happen. You've got your Messianic believers and you've got Christianity, which is building up in the Roman Catholic, in the Roman Catholic world. And they persecuted the Jews. And so for them, that would have been an enemy of Judaism, you know, um, understandably. They've actually slipped in another little um, anti-Yeshua prayer in the Elenu prayer, but I, I won't go into that. But it's, um, that it, it's quite interesting how, you know, this, this has snuck its way in in a number of places to try and weed out the believers in, in Yeshua. Right. The Avot, the Fathers. This is the last one we'll cover, or second last one. We're just going to quickly touch on the Nishmat prayer. Uh, the Avot is the first of the um, three first benedictions that we look at. And this is an important one for us. It says, Blessed are you, Lord our God, and God of our fathers, God of Abraham, God of Isaac, and God of Jacob, the great, mighty, and awesome God, the most high God, who bestows grace and creates all and remembers the devotion of the fathers, some important points there, and brings a redeemer to their children's children for his name's sake with love. King, help us, saviour, shield. Blessed are you, Lord, shield of Abraham. Through this prayer, we acknowledge that we are coming to our God, Adonai, through the merit of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Um, and we'll cover more on this in our small study group, and we'll, we'll look at it in more detail next week, be, uh, because it's really important for us as believers in Yeshua. We come into covenant through Abraham. This is the heart of Judaism. Not just us, but all of Judaism. Remember I said all of Judaism has to be grafted in? All of Judaism comes in through Abraham. Judaism doesn't stand on its own merit. They stand, it stands on the merit of Abraham. Why? Because he was the first one to cross over. Uh, Moshe is called the first redeemer of the people of Israel. But in Judaism, Abraham is considered to be the first redeemer of the world. Um, he was the first one to try and make rectification for Adam and Eve's sin, for the fall. He's the first one that stepped back out of idol worship on his own accord and said, Shema Israel Adonai Eloheinu Adonai Ehad. God is one. There is none else. All these idols are rubbish. He's the first one that tried to make that rectification. Was he perfect? No, he failed. Yeshua will come. The Messiah will come and he will rectify again the covenant of Abraham and he will reconcile us back to the covenant of Abraham. The covenant of Abraham is important for us as Messianic believers. Yes, we have Yeshua, very important, but if you read the scriptures that we're going to look at, Yeshua is the one that brings us back into that covenant. So there's an important link there that if we just ignore Abraham and only focus on Yeshua, we're missing something of what we're actually being saved for, saved into. Mm -hmm. 
Sorry, I missed that slide. There it is for you. <laughs> it's in the notes, exactly. Three times a day we proclaim that he is king and we come in the merit of the vote, the fathers, the patriarchs. And we expect, with the expectation of a Messiah who is to come. The vote is simply a way of saying we are coming and looking for a redeemer to come through the merit of Abraham Avinu. This redeemer will bring us back into a personal relationship with the mighty one of Israel. So as believers in Yeshua, we already have a taste of that. We've already been brought in to that relationship with God through Yeshua. But um, the Jews haven't. The, the Jews haven't got that yet. So they need to come through this prayer. They need this prayer to recognize the Messiah. So while unbelieving Jews are still waiting for the Messiah to come uh, and do that for them, we already partake in this as we see in Galatians 3, 7 to 9. Be assured then that it is those who live by trusting and being faithful who are really the children of Abraham. Also, the Tanakh foreseeing that God would consider the Gentile righteous when they live by trusting and being faithful, told the good news to Abraham in advance by saying, in connection with you, all the going will be blessed. Remember that? Blessed, grafted in. He had the good news back there already. <laughs> So then, those who rely on trusting and being faithful are blessed along with Abraham, who trusted and was faithful. And again, Galatians 3.29. So, uh, so if you belong to Messiah, you are seed of Abraham and heirs according to the promise. The promise is something we covered a few times in Shimon Kiefer's um, uh, message a few weeks ago uh, where he was talking about the promise and we didn't really touch on it enough but it's basically reintroduced itself here we need to have a look at what the promise actually meant uh, what people understood when Shimon Kiefer said the promise it, it it the hint here is something to do with Abraham but we'll have a look at Abraham and and his importance to our relationship with God a bit more next week there's a couple of things that we need to really um, own, highlight, own, uh, understand. So I want to finish with the Nishmat prayer. It's in your handouts. I think it's the last page of the handouts. Um, it's called Nishmat Kol Hai, the soul of every living thing. It is said to be one of the most eloquent uh, prayers of gratitude beginning with the Hebrew phrase nishmat kol shayam, shaya, I should say, chaya, soul of every living being. This prayer, which is part of the Jewish prayer setter today, uh, is recited on Shabbat and on festivals, as well as on the Passover setter. It's quite ancient. Uh, actually, it probably goes, the, the contents of it goes before uh, Shimon Kiefer's time, as you can see, he uses uh, Psalm 103 and Psalm 121. So, so the, the essence of it, again, is from Scripture, and he, and he pulls it together. Um, and so it's obvious, it most likely is well over 2,000 years old. Um, it's suggested that the Nishmat prayer is not just a prayer for Jews, but for all of humankind, with examples. So I'll read a little bit from it. The soul of every living being shall bless your name, Lord our God, and the spirit of all flesh shall always glorify and exalt your remembrance, our King. From eternity to eternity, you are God, and other than you, we have no King, Redeemer or Saviour, who liberates, rescues, sustains, and shows us compassion in every time of distress and anguish. We have no King but you. God of the first and the last, God of all creatures, master of all ages, extolled by a multitude of praises, who guides his world with loving kindness and his creatures with compassion. Do you notice some familiar words there already that are in the um, 
uh, apostolic writings. I was going to say, he reads to me like a dedicate. Yeah. He makes the mute speak, sets the bound free, supports the fallen, and raises those bowed down. For every mouth shall give thanks to you, every tongue shall vow allegiance to you, every knee shall bow to you, every upright body shall bow to you, all hearts shall fear you, and all our innermost feelings and thoughts shall sing praises to your name. There's definitely some familiar words there from the apostolic writings. <laughs> and the Psalms, yep. It is believed that the prayer of Nishmat was written by, uh, as I said, Shimon Kifa, uh, also known as Rabbi Shimon Kifa. Rabbi uh, Jacob Tam, from around 1100, 1170, uh, who was a prominent French Tosafist. Don't ask me what that is. I should have looked it up, I know. But uh, anyone know what a Tosafist is, Ryan? Probably someone, a, a scribe or a book, like, book hmm. person. Could be, yep. Books, yeah. He asserted that Kiefer wrote this magnificent prayer. Einstein, in 1907, authored the Hebrew language encyclopedia Otsa Yisrael. He cites a midrash that also makes this claim. Uh, there is also an ancient Yemenite prayer book that states that Kiefer wrote the prayer of Nishma. So there's three different sources that seem to indicate uh, this. So next week we will finish off uh, the Hebrew prayers with a closer look at what it means to pray in Yeshua's name. Uh, has anybody come across that understanding, what it means to pray in Yeshua's name? It's not just a tag at the end of a prayer, it actually has a specific um, significance when we pray that. We'll look at what it means to be sons and daughters of Abraham. So continuing on from the theme that we've just looked at, uh, Abraham's importance. And we'll also look at the uh, disciples' prayer next week, the, what has been called the Lord's Prayer. Um, then someone's called it the disciples' prayer. And in Judaism, it would actually be called the Avinu uh, because that's, the name of the prayer is how it starts, you know, our Father. Um, so these are all important concepts that we actually need to grasp for us to go further into the study of, of the book of Acts. We need to get those foundations, that the, the prayer, our, how we tie in with um, Abraham and so on. So, question time. A lot of information, I know, I'm sorry. I already took some out for next week. <laughs> I've got a question, it may seem like a stupid question, yeah, but no. with the bowing with the knee, why do they bow from the hip? Like the, the right. image, because isn't it called the... Yes, um, that, that's a good point. Uh, in this case, you only bow from the hip. Um, in the uh, avot prayer, as you see, there's actually bowing from the knee, okay. the hip, and then straighten back up. So, yeah, it's kind of like uh, yes. Why this one is only bowing at the at the hip? I don't know. That's a good question. It's not. A, it's not a silly question. No. It's a good no. question. Isn't it called the bowing of the hip? Like yeah. how it's called to bow the knee? It, uh, Baku. That that's the Baku prayer. Baku means knee. Yeah. Um, and so bowing the knee. Yes. Yeah. So you would expect it to be bowing yeah, at the knee for this, yeah. but okay. but they only bow. Um, at there the must waist. be a reason mm. for it. Everything has a reason like that. that but you kind could, of details you could do that if you wanted to. Oh, yeah. Than you, yeah, you, you don't, you, I don't think you have to. Um, yeah. mm. But, just, but yeah. it's it's a slightly different bowing process as it is when you say the avot prayer because blessed you actually go down with a knee. Um, are you, you go forward and then Lord you stand up. So it's a three step bowing as opposed to the two step bowing. Mm -hmm. Yeah, good question though. Yeah. Mm -hmm. It's an interesting um, thing to see the form, the formalised prayers, so much in it. You, when you begin to understand how they were made up and, that, and the mm. heart essence and the spirit of it, it brings a new dimension. Mm. Mm. It's an interesting thing to see coming out of Christendom, coming out of Pentecostalism, that would not view formal prayers as useful. Yeah, perhaps useful, or it would be seen as, as just... Almost to, religious, or... Uh, that's the word, yeah. religious. Right, right learning, instead right, of right. from the heart. Yeah. So it's an interesting shift of thinking mm. to think that these prayers make room for the... Not just petition, but adoration and 
and, and the whole thing that you've got something physical to do that adds a dimension and focuses your, your whole spirit, soul and body, your whole being mm -hmm. into an action that then is an expression, you know. Mm -hmm. um, it's such a transition from just free flowing prayers and not to say that there isn't room mm -hmm. for that no. yet. No, because so we'll, we'll see later on that they actually, in the book of Acts a little bit later, that they also prayed outside of the three times a day prayer time. Yes. So, um, and that was probably one of our biggest concerns when we first started this walk was are we going to be locked into these rote prayers that are religious and we're not be able to pray as we just want Freely. to pray and, mm -hmm. and in fact as you study the book of Acts you'll see that there's plenty of opportunity and room for yeah. free flowing yeah. prayer so mm -hmm. it's a combination of both we've got the beauty of both the balance, yeah. mm -hmm. um, it, it, so it's actually not a replacement of and I think when you first come you think oh three times a day right. set prayers mm. because, you know that's the only way you pray it's a re Location of temple service, yeah. Right. Yeah. which is right. why it's got that halakhic things to it. But mm -hmm. even in Orthodox yeah. Judaism, you can pray whenever, however, yeah. out, around that. These yeah. are just to replace the formality of a temple with. Yes, its, correct. In, you know. Yeah. yeah. So, the other thing I wanted to mention was with the minimum. Mm -hmm. um, you know how it says the not stream and the minimum. I think minimum was a term mm. that Pharisees and Essenes used for each other. So it's just a sectarian term yeah, for those yeah. not a part of us. So yeah, yeah. I think in particular, like you said, though, the, the Nazarenes were very much uh, caught to that because they were, yeah, yeah, yeah. quite different. Yeah. For well, I, I, I like the, I mean, um, Rabbi Sachs actually, mm. his explanation really clarifies it well because um, it was the ones that were threatening to to split the Jewish world and you know mm -hmm. which of those sects now have had impact on the Jewish world maybe Hasidism is the only one yeah. that's that had a major uh, mm -hmm. impact on splitting the Jewish world but they're back together now to yes. a degree you know they'll accept one another mm -hmm. so they, it, those, those other sects at the time did just didn't have the power Some, the ability yes. um, and remember when the um, that's true. Uh, some people came, came to the Sanhedrin, some of the, the leaders, and said, you know, what are we going to do about these guys? And, and the, uh, I think it was Gamaliel who was very clever. He said to, to them, uh, mm -hmm. look, there's been others that have yeah. come before. You know, mm -hmm. this, rebel this one claimed to be Messiah, the tower yeah. fell on and all this. They all died. He said, yeah. if this is God, yeah. then who are we to kick against it? Let it keep going. But if it's not God, then it will die out itself. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And... You know, that makes sense um, all the us. others died out themselves. The, the only one that was strong enough to stay around was Messianic Judaism because the Messiah. <laughs> and, you know, we have the Holy Spirit, the Ruach HaKadosh. So. Mm -hmm. Great. Let's have a cup of coffee, 10 minutes, and then we'll come.